Well, thanks everyone for coming out. I uh, really appreciate it. And um, yeah, I hope, hope this is a good uh, presentation for everyone. So my name is Adam Roboto. I consult under the banner Noise to Signal. It's also the name of my blog that uh, Mark just mentioned. And today's talk is 10 ways analytics teams are making their lives harder and how R can help. So we'll be digging into that, but first, just by way of introduction, I uh, mentioned my name. So I'm a freelance analyst, data engineer, data scientist. Uh, you can see there me and my daughter. This is, uh, you can often find us outside and, and masked and trying to soak up as much outdoor time as we can before the winter hits. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, and uh, things are gonna get real. A lot of, a lot of indoor time plan for this winter. So uh, Mark mentioned that my background is mostly in the agency space. So I think when I talk about the issues facing analytics teams, uh, my context and my background is through working at agencies, not necessarily on the client side. Um, so that's, that's where my perspective is going to be coming from, but hopefully it's still applicable to analytics departments or teams uh, you know, in, in the client space as well. And uh, I've been consulting under Noise to Signal for the last five years. So, you know, essentially freelancing and, and bringing in subcontractors for various data engineering, data uh, analyst and uh, uh, analytics tagging implementation, um, you know, projects. And earned my master's of science uh, in data science for Northeastern uh, just this year, so in April. Uh, you have my link to my GitHub. So a lot of what I'm going to cover today are, it's, it's kind of an amalgamation of some uh, blog posts that I've done and some projects that I post on GitHub. So, you know, I'll, I'll make these uh, slides available to everyone after the talk. And then you can also find some of the source code for some of the things that I'm showing either on GitHub or in, in these blog posts. And certainly feel free to reach out to me um, at Adam at, at noise to signal So I have two goals for today's presentation. One is to describe common issues facing analytics teams, and the other is to share examples of how R can help. And I wanted to separate the, out these goals because I want to make it clear that even if we just accomplish the first goal, I think that will be an accomplishment. Because part of this talk is kind of acknowledging and exposing some common issues that I've seen facing various analytics teams just through, through my experience. And I think it's good to talk about that. I think this is kind of the right forum to talk about those issues and say, yeah, I've, I've also seen that, or no, I haven't seen this, or this is how I've addressed it. So that's, that's one goal, right? And then there's how R can help. And that, uh, I, that is a fun topic for me, but not even, not really the primary goal, right? Because these issues can be addressed in lots of different ways. I've found where R can solve a lot of these issues, or at least, you know, assist in some way. Others might find other solutions as well. So wanted to separate these goals. And I, I think, you know, hopefully everyone can get on board with the first one. The second one, I think, you know, depending on your context, your background, is R going to be the right tool for it? You know, you can watch the presentation and see if, if you feel like that's the case. So for those of you who may be unfamiliar with R&R &R Studio, I thought it'd be good just to give a, a tiny bit of background here. And I am gonna be doing some demos and, and show and tell, so you'll be able to see some of the stuff in action. But R is an open source data first programming language. It was uh, created in 1991, but its roots go back to Bell Labs in 1976 with the uh, creation of S, its precursor. And something that makes R uh, special, a couple things that make R special, one that it's, it really is meant to be data first. So you'll see that it, it applied in a lot of statistical and research scenarios, data science scenarios, um, but also the community is another thing that makes it special. So just thousands upon thousands, you can see that chart there of contributed packages on CRAN, which is their uh, you know, package repository, library repository. Uh, 16,000 uh, recently. So, you know, tons and tons of packages. If you can think of a problem, it's probably al already been addressed in some package or another. So, uh, you know, these packages are also open source. So you can really dig in. And then there's RStudio, and I'll be talking about a couple RStudio products, including their IDE, their uh, development environment, um, it, which is open source, but it's also a company. So it, it's a company that uh, sells uh, sort of add-on services or enterprise grade services around R. So they have a, a professional grade server for hosting R environments for distributed teams. And they have R Studio Cloud, which is a newer product that I'll do a quick demo of um, here as well. So just some primer for those of you joining who may not have uh, uh, had any experience with R in the past. 
So, um, all right, I, I did want to kind of address maybe a, an elephant in the room for some, which is, you know, there's often a debate that's that's around you know, R versus Python, which is better for, for various scenarios. And, and I'm, I'm not really interested in that, that debate for this discussion. Um, hopefully I, I made that clear in the earlier conversation around our goals. You know, R might work for some people and it might not work for others. I think the most important takeaway from this conversation is you know, what problems exist and how might we address them and talk about them. And R will solve some of them. If you are a Python pro and your organization is super committed to Python, you can do most of the things that I'm talking about here in Python as well. Uh, my background is R and you know, so that's where I'm coming from for uh, some of these solutions. Okay, so I want to kick off the, um, you know, the, the problems and solutions uh, with an anecdote. So uh, this was something that kind of inspired this, this uh, well, it was first a blog post and now a talk as well, uh, which was that I was filling in as an analytics manager for an agency in Boston. Uh, the manager was going on maternity leave and we had a, a, a handoff meeting, you know, before she left, uh, just talking about the group and, and what was coming up. And she mentioned a presentation that she was about to give to one of the clients. And she said, you know, I've been working on this presentation for a while, but don't worry, we're going to, uh, uh, you know, finish it uh, before you come in here. So you shouldn't have to worry about it. And of course, you know, everything that can go wrong uh, will go wrong. Uh, the presentation wasn't, you know, it, it got pushed back until after she had to leave. So it was uh, picked up uh, by me. And I open up the PowerPoint deck that she'd been working on, and it's 113 slides. <laughs> so my jaw hit the floor, and uh, realizing that I was going to need to really buckle in and figure out what's going on here, and, and you know, figure out how to uh, how to deliver this presentation to the client. And I started digging, I started digging, and found that the materials in the slide were ex. Uh, exported from Google Analytics. So they're, you know, Excel file or CSV exports from Google Analytics that were then worked on in Excel to create certain charts and then pasted into PowerPoint. And uh, the problem that I quickly ran into here, well, I'll talk about a couple problems, uh, is that I wasn't able to reproduce the same data. So, you know, even though I was seeing this number in the slide deck, if I went into GA and tried to pull that exact same figure, it was different. So it was making it really difficult for me to, you know, dig in and understand where these analyses came from, why the recommendations were what they were. Uh, so it was, a, it was a huge mess. <laughs> and, um, I think Mark, Mark mentioned, you know, I've worked with a couple different agencies and in, in, in the Boston area and different clients. And, you know, as a freelancer, I think one of, the, one of the reasons I really like freelancing is that I just get exposed to so many different environments, different departments, different teams, and see the way th they do things. And this isn't that uncommon, right? The sort of exporting a spreadsheet, emailing it around, putting it into a, you know, PowerPoint deck, and then getting, you know, modified by somebody else, then emailing it back and, you know, so the, this is something that uh, that just felt you know felt very strong. There, there's got to be a better way, and and you know I've been doing a lot of thinking around uh, what that better way might be. So these are the uh, the ten problems that I identified, and using that experience of working with different agencies and groups uh, to identify some shortcomings and how um, analytics teams either collaborate or uh, or just produce analyses. Uh, I'm not going to uh, list them all right now because we're going to go through these in detail throughout the presentation. But I think those first three, you know, you can kind of see where I'm getting at with that anecdote around re-giving a presentation that was produced by somebody else. If I can't automate, you know, pulling down the data again, then I'm probably going to get different numbers than they did. Um, if the slide charts can't easily be updated, you know, it's going to be difficult for me. If there's no opportunity to comment on the decisions that are made along the way, it's going to be difficult for somebody else to pick it up. So. We'll go through these. And I want to point out before we uh, talk about these problems is that I'm, I'm not trying to point my finger at any, any one in particular, you know, any type of person in particular. I think that these problems develop organically uh, for a couple different reasons. And, and these are some reasons that I identified. There, there might be others that, that you've seen in your experience. But one, I believe that digital analytics is a newer discipline. And here I'm, I'm talking about you know, web marketing, digital analytics, uh, it's, it's constantly evolving and it doesn't have the same history and, and pedigree that maybe something that just, you know, software engineering has or, or longer lasting uh, discipline. So I think that things are kind of shifting and it's hard to settle on best practices there. Um, another reason is that 
the marketplace is super fragmented when it comes to the different tools that analytics teams use. So I'm sure everyone here has seen the Scott Brinker post on MarTech Technologies and how there's 8,000 different MarTech vendors, you know, floating around these days. And you go into different agencies or clients and there's a different stack, you know, every time you go there. So again, just makes it harder to kind of coalesce around a single set of procedures or a single set of tools. And then the third reason why I think that this kind of, uh, th these problems uh, bubble up is that collaboration isn't always a requirement for an analyst. Uh, in many cases, say in the agency setting, an analyst is assigned to two or three clients and then the, uh, the analyst next to them is assigned to another two, three clients and they have no need to collaborate necessarily, or they're not, you know, as in their day-to-day -day function, they're not collaborating. And on the client side, analysts are often, um, placed into individual business units. So there might be one in sales and there might be one in marketing and there might be one in operations, but they're not you know, under a single uh, analytics or analyst uh, business unit themselves. And so the collaboration isn't always there. So, so I'm gonna make a push for more collaboration even in those scenarios. I think you know, analysts should kind of band together and learn from one another. And so a lot of my solutions are around how do we uh, increase collaboration? How do you handle scenarios where someone's hit by a bus or what have you? Um, and, and so that's one of the things I'm trying to address in some of my suggestions. So let's dig in. So uh, first problem, unable to automate data tasks. So going back to that anecdote I gave, you know, wouldn't have been nice if I could just click a button and rerun all of the data pools that the, uh, that the previous manager had run for that client, be able to recreate the exact, you know, charts that they had. And so uh, I think this is, you know, Automation, I think it makes sense in a lot of cases when you're uh, doing rerunnable work. It might not always make sense if it's just a completely ad hoc one-off one analysis, but when a presentation or a, a product, a work product goes to a certain scale and size or repeatability, I think it makes a lot of sense to look towards automating that. So if we look at how this can be solved in R, uh, there is a package for Google Analytics uh, created and maintained by uh, Mark Edmondson that I use quite a bit in, in a lot of my work. I would You'll notice throughout the slide, I work a lot with uh, Google's stack. And uh, pulling data from, from Google Analytics and R is as you know, simple as, as this line of code here. You supply a view ID, you supply a date range, what dimensions do you wanna pull and what kind of metrics do you wanna pull? So I just wanna share an example just to show uh, you know, kind of what this looks like. So I'm gonna jump into R Studio. Uh, and for anybody who hasn't seen our studio before, this is the, uh, the development environment that most people use when working with R. And, you know, I can't give you a full sort of uh, review and, and, and training here, although I'd love to. Um, but uh, just to show you kind of, you know, what it looks like to actually do some automation and, and pull data uh, from Google Analytics and R. So uh, the document I'm in right now, it's called a notebook. Um, those of you who've worked with Jupyter notebooks in Python might be familiar with the concept of a notebook. It's a document that allows you to mix code with commentary. So I can mix markdown here uh, with code here and uh, it allows for better collaboration and communication through you know, actually being able to put descriptions of text uh, next to your code and the output. So we have some, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm um, sharing something. We're only seeing the problem slide. Oh, shoot. Thank you. I must have shared the application or I, I probably shared um, Chrome. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> How long were you guys going to let me get away with that? <laughs> not, not, not long. <laughs> um, you know, it's weird. I actually don't see that option for screen. I just see the applications. Advanced. Oh. Select a window or application. Oh, application. that's right. Yeah, usually I feel like you can usually just do your whole screen. I'm gonna have to stop and restart the sharing to flip between them, um, but that's okay. Oh, okay. Can you see uh, our studio now? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so uh, you know, hopefully that, that description still sticks in your mind. This is a notebook. It's the mix of code and commentary here, uh, Markdown. And so I just wanted to show kind of a quick example. What does it look like to automate the process of grabbing data from Google Analytics and, and visualizing it? Um, so I can run some quick setup code, which basically just authenticates me to Google Analytics. And then here we have the call that I showed in the slide, which is, you know, give me some data from Google Analytics. If I run that line, I can inspect what was returned by clicking the GA object. And we can see here, pulling down the date, channel grouping sessions, pretty basic stuff. 
And I can then run this line of code to visualize it as a bar chart. So splitting up the traffic by channel and showing it over time. Okay, so pretty basic. Uh, some more visualizations here if you wanted to do a box plot, because we love box plots. Uh, and uh, a more advanced uh, visualization here, a um, funnel visualization I've been working on uh, to show traffic steps in terms of steps through a funnel where the uh, traffic, you know, you have 100% of the users and 66%, 35%, 3% reached the step two. So anyway, uh, those are some uh, basic steps or, or basic capabilities, you know, being able to pull data from GA and, and something that I think would benefit uh, folks who are repeatedly pulling data from a source. And hopefully, I know there's some code here, uh, but with just a little bit of an introduction, you know, not, not too intimidating. So, um, uh, at risk, of, I'm, I'm not going to jump back into the uh, let's see the slide deck. Let's see. Okay, right. Yeah, so the next thing I wanted to show is an HTML document, which I'm going to have to share it separately. One sec, sorry. Okay, so um, so automating uh, the analysis itself is useful, but there's other things you can audit as well. Uh, you can automate as well uh, through code. Uh, so one thing that I um, often task with is uh, uh, audit auditing a um, new implementation or sorry, a client's implementation of Google Analytics or Google Tag Manager to understand what's going on there, see if there's any anomalies, any configuration issues that uh, need to be addressed. And so that's a, another task that I've been able to automate through R. Uh, so I created this audit tool using the same uh, technology that I showed you. It's an R notebook that runs code and then compiles this document here. So you can see it goes through the uh, GA properties, it goes through the views, it, it pulls some uh, the goals, the filters, it looks at some data integrity. So are the goals actually firing in the last 30 days, last 90 days? Uh, it pulls uh, common events, looks at some basic trends just so you can get a sense of, you know, oh, there's no data coming in after this date. Now that's a problem. So uh, this, the code for this audit tool is up on my GitHub. Um, if anybody here is using Google Analytics and wants an introduction to R, it could be a good introduction to see what it can do. Uh, but I wanted to point out that the automation of tasks uh, doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, pulling down data just for reporting purposes, but there might be configuration purposes as well. You know, R is super extensible. There's lots of different things you can do with it. It could do web scraping if you wanted to pull, uh, do some sort of like tagging analysis and understand what tags are uh, on, you know, 1,000 pages of a website. It could crawl the website and, and find that out. So I thought that was another relevant uh, use case to share. Okay, so the second problem that I mentioned earlier is uh, recreating slides and, uh, and the manual updates of slides. And um, so in this instance, uh, you know, I mentioned having to recreate 100, not, I didn't have to recreate 113 slides, but there were quite a few slides where the, the uh, visualizations needed to be updated. And you can imagine a scenario where you're, you're sitting on a PowerPoint presentation that has, I don't know, 50 slides of charts and a stakeholder comes back to you and says, oh, actually I needed you to do this from, you know, 15 days back instead of 30 days back. And I'm sure we've all run into scenarios like that where, you know, we've completed an analysis and like, oh, just one more thing. <laughs> and it actually invalidates, you know, the however many slides you'd, you'd, uh, you'd produced. So uh, I just wanted to share this example. This is one that I don't use quite as often in R, but it is certainly an option, which is that uh, in this sort of notebook uh, scenario, you can output not just HTML, not just PDFs, but you can also output, uh, output PowerPoints as well. And the nice thing is that you can output uh, PowerPoints using a, a template that you select. So if you want it to be styled and themed uh, according to your own you know, organization's themes, you can do that. So here I have uh, just some basic tables and charts. And like I mentioned, that scenario where the stakeholder comes back and says, oh, you know what, you know, we actually need this going back 15 days to, 
today instead of uh, 30 days, you can run that. I'm actually just going to rerun all the code chunks to output the uh, visualizations and then knit to PowerPoint. And you can see we have a PowerPoint. Oh, <laughs> you probably can't see because I'm sharing our, oh man, yeah, I really wish I could share my whole screen. Here you go. Hopefully you see that. Um, so this is this is what was output by the uh, by uh, our studio. Um, so you can see, you know, it is themed using my noise to signal theme, and we have the charts and graphs that we want. It is fairly limited, though, in terms of the output. You know, you have the option of one column, two column. You can do tables, charts. You can put markdown into the slides. So in this instance, it probably only makes sense if you have a you know reports that are weekly or monthly that have a pretty rigid um, setup in terms of the the styling and any annotations you would want. Uh, it might make sense in a scenario where you have a more stylized presentation and you just want to copy and paste 10 slides into that presentation. You want to automate those slides. You could just kind of copy and paste them. So, you know, it's, it's not going to be your solution to every single PowerPoint presentation, but I thought it was worth sharing that uh, there's more automation that can occur and you don't have to think about automation just in terms of creating a single chart, but you can create HTML documents, PDF documents, and PowerPoint slides as well. Okay, so uh, another problem that was uh, uh, mentioned earlier is difficulty in adding commentary. So um, in picking up that presentation, there were a lot of decisions that were made between the point that data was pulled, data was transformed, uh, analyses were written up in the PowerPoint deck itself. And it can be hard to interpret if you're just left with the end product, why certain decisions were made, why, why different transformations were made. And a nice thing about using R as the primary tool for an analysis is that you have this notebook functionality of mixing code and commentary. Um, so I'm not gonna uh, jump back into R. You can see an example here, and we've been looking at examples in our studio about how you can mix the uh, markdown with the, uh, the slides themselves. And this is something that I do quite a bit. Um, in fact, uh, actually I do wanna show something. Um, I, I've done it to the extent that I've actually started writing blog posts in our studio. So you can see here, if I'm hopefully sharing the right thing. Um, so this is a blog post, you'll find it on, on my blog talking about market basket analysis using R against website data. And you know, I wrote it in our studio because that was the easiest way to uh, make sure that the commentary and the graphics were one to one. I was able to sort of explain what I was doing and and make sure that you know these tables actually lined up with what I was saying here, rather than just exporting a bunch of images, writing in WordPress, and then kind of having to go back. And so you know, that's just one example of how you can use Markdown. Um, but I think from a collaboration perspective and talking about working with teammates, having a deliverable that has some of this commentary embedded in it is much more powerful than providing a few images in a, in a PowerPoint deck. Okay, so another problem that I've seen uh, different analytics teams face is limitations in the types of visualizations that they're producing. So. Here you might recognize on the left, Google Analytics, and uh, I hope nobody here is just you know, copying and pasting screenshots out of Google Analytics because they're horrid. Um, and then on the right is a, a generic Excel visualization that I, I Googled and found. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's a, um, uh, you know, there's a certain set of visualizations I think we lean on quite a bit uh, in terms of, you know, bar charts and line charts and, and time series data. Um, but there's, there's, there's so many more options out there and there's plenty of inspiration out there for um, finding new ways of getting your message across and, and delivering visualizations. So I do want to go on just a, a tiny bit of a tangent here and uh, talk about kind of R's approach to uh, visualization and graphics, or at least one particular library uh, their approach to visualization and graphics. And it's based on the grammar of graphics, which was a concept introduced by Leland Wilkinson in the 80s. He was determined to make a coding library that could produce any type of chart imaginable. And he wrote that in Java. Uh, and I, I don't know if, if that was considered a huge success, that library itself. 
Uh, but the concept stuck around. It was picked up by Hadley Wickham, who uh, works at our studio and, and uh, contributes many, many different packages uh, to the art community. And uh, it has been formalized in a, in a package called ggplot, grammar of graphics plot, uh, under these concepts of any visualization, any chart that you can think of is comprised of a theme, a coordinate system, statistics, facets, geometries, aesthetics, and data. I'm not going to go into you know breakdown of all of these, but but hopefully you can kind of see how uh, you know the difference between a pie chart and a a line chart is really in the the or uh, say a bar chart is really in the coordinate system, right? A pie chart's coordinate system is radial, and a bar chart's coordinate system is uh, Cartesian. So, you know, you can kind of take any visualization you can imagine and break it down into these component parts and uh, they can be built up in R to uh, produce its output. So, uh, as, a, as a demonstration of this, I took the charts that are within um, Cole Nussbaum or Netflix Storytelling with Data. This is a great book. I'd highly recommend it. Talks about uh, how to uh, communicate through data to stakeholders and non data practitioners. And uh, so I took every single chart that she had uh, generated throughout this book and recreated them in, in ggplot. And this code is, you know, it's open source, it's available on, on my GitHub. Um, so you can see here, you know, this is all using a single package within R to produce all these different uh, visualizations. And I you know, wanted to prove out the point that using ggplot, you can really go nuts in terms of the types of visualizations. You can see everything here from sort of the heat map style to scatter plot to bar chart to just text and annotations, um, you know, really anything that you can imagine. And it's all using those, uh, those same components that I, I, I showed earlier, the themes, coordinates, statistics, facets. Um, so each of these charts can be broken out into, into those constituent parts. So hopefully that, that gives kind of a demonstration of, um, you know, where, where we can go as a practice to uh, go beyond, you know, some of the default uh, bar charts, line charts that are available within packages. And again, I definitely recommend the book. It gets you thinking about um, how to highlight the story within the, the data visualization that you're building and how to communicate the, the important parts of it. Okay, uh, let's see, how am I doing on time? I'm doing okay. So problem number five, charts and analyses are not versioned. So um, going back to the collaboration question of how analysts can collaborate with one another, uh, there's something magical that happens when your analyses are done in code, which is that you can version them and keep track of every single change you've made, and not only that, have commentary associated with each of those commits. So I'm not sure how many people are familiar with GitHub. It's a, a well, Git in particular, which is a particular uh, code versioning uh, software. Um, so something that happened when I was on this journey recreating these visualizations, I posted on the storytelling with data message board saying, "Hey, you know, I'm taking on this project. I'm going to try to do a chart a day. If anybody wants to help, you know, feel free." And to my surprise, somebody took me up on it. Um, this guy Wall. Uh, 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 connected when I was about halfway through the project and started committing to uh, GitHub. Um, and it, it, it just kind of reinforced this concept of how exciting it is to have collaboration as an analyst and be able to, you know, we were able to bounce ideas off each other and, and uh, bring to bear, you know, packages and concepts that, you know, each other hadn't really heard of before. Uh, so it was a really nice kind of demonstration of this type of collaboration. And something that I think teams it could could use more of, um, and it takes familiarity with code and, and being able to treat your analyses of code certainly. So that's you know that's that's the barrier to entry, uh, but I think it's definitely a worthwhile one and breaks away again from this concept of you know static Excel sheets or static emails or static PowerPoint slides that uh, are problematic for reasons I've already described. Okay, so uh, another um, problem here uh, related to uh, collaboration. So um, at, at an agency, you're uh, performing analyses for lots of different clients. And I think, you know, a, a problem that all agencies are faced with is uh, reusability of work product. In an ideal scenario, every time you solve a problem for one client, you're able to immediately apply it to another client. 
and that is a goal that is almost never <laughs> achieved uh, for a million different reasons. You know, you're under budget, you're under pressure to get things done on time, and uh, you know that work product isn't either communicated to other people who might need it or isn't really saved to a central repository. And so I, I, I think, again, going back to treating analyses as code, it kind of encourages that mentality because you, as somebody who's working on analysis, you don't want to rewrite the code a second time, right, if you've done it a first time. Uh, so you're incentivized then to hold on to these and store them in a central repository. If you have visualizations that you're often using or complex analyses that you're often running, you want to save that in a central library. And by having a central library, ideally some sort of code repository, it then becomes visible to others in your organization and team. So um, you're, you're probably seeing a theme of what I'm you know, suggesting here, which is sort of treating analysis more like uh, engineering and, and software development, where we can leverage some of the tools that they have uh, already kind of perfected in a way in terms of continuous deployment and, and uh, code versioning. Uh, and applying those to to uh, the work of analysts. So uh, another uh, problem that I've definitely seen um, at uh, at different agencies is um, teams that are very dependent on the tool of choice, uh, whatever was purchased at that agency, or maybe the clients using and therefore limiting their analyses to whatever is kind of out of box with that tool. And by that, I mean the, you know, the tableaus or the Power BI's or the uh, uh, domos or, um, you know, or just working within Google Analytics itself or Adobe Analytics. Uh, so I think, um, so something where, where R uh, can help there. And again, you know, Python and other tools can certainly do this as well, but uh, allow sort of expand the opportunities for the types of analyses that you're running. So you're no longer limited by uh, what one vendor is supplying, you're limited by what code can do, which, which is pretty much anything and what the contributed uh, community packages within R can provide, which is a lot. So, uh, you know, on the top left here, we have time series forecasting. I have a blog post about this looking at um, causal inference and whether uh, a certain event can be causally related to the changes that you're seeing in a performance metric. So that's that's provided by a, a library, a time series forecasting library. Market basket analysis, uh, looking at the combinatorics of, of different web page views and understanding what commonly what page views are commonly associated with other page views. So that's a more advanced analysis that you're not going to find out of box in a you know a Tableau or a Power BI. Uh, and then the bottom one, performance percentiles. Um, this is, uh, I have another blog post up about using uh, Google's new web vital performance metrics and implementing them on your website and then running the analysis through R because uh, the way that Google asks that you interpret these performance um, metrics is to use percentiles. And Google Analytics by default is not gonna give you percentiles for anything. Um, so, uh, and R is especially equipped to, you know, provide results in terms of percentiles, it's pretty easy to do. So just an application here where, you know, was stymied by what is provided out of box by Google Analytics. But if you have access to uh, R or, you know, certainly Python, um, there's ways that you can kind of get around that and run the analysis that you need to run. Okay. So another problem, uh, dependent on locally installed software. So I'm sure we've all run into issues where uh, you're attempting to recreate the results of somebody else and maybe they're different. Maybe you don't have the right license for a certain piece of software or you have a new laptop and, and you don't have certain things installed. So uh, I wanna, the, the next two slides are talking about, you know, cloud, different cloud resources. And it, it feels to me that analysts could uh, become a bit more cloud native in, in their operations. Um, it's there's certainly scenarios where it may not be appropriate and there's scenarios where it's appropriate, but I thought uh, there are uh, there are certainly cases where this is appropriate and I wanted to give a quick demonstration of our studio cloud. So this is a product that was released in August by our studio and uh, let me back up for a second. So this is our studio cloud right here. And it's, it's the RStudio environment as a service, essentially. You can spin up what are called projects, which are uh, R environments that have your own packages loaded, your own 
uh, yeah, your own packages and, and styling and themes loaded. And uh, it allows you to do this entirely within the browser, which enables a number of different things. It means that you can you know, just provide a link if you wanted to share an analysis or, or results with a colleague, you can, can send a link and you can be 100% confident that the code you supply in that link is gonna be rerunnable on their machine because they're really running it uh, here. So I thought this was pretty cool. I, because the sharing, I can't alt tab between this and our studio, but hopefully you can see here that you know it looks 100% like the IDE I was running locally, uh, which is pretty cool. And and um, just to show you know the same code is going to run here, and it is able to uh, knit that same sort of uh, R Markdown uh, document. Um, this might not be sharing actually. It popped up a new window, but take my word for it. Um, that it's able to compile this into HTML and, and you know, or a PDF or, or what have you. Um, hey Adam, so, yeah, Adam, I got a quick question. Sure. I didn't want to interrupt you. Sorry. Uh, no. I'm about to I'm about to do this myself, like oh. today, tomorrow, uh, for a professional portfolio. Uh, it, uh, so this R stuff, the, the markdown you loaded to GitHub. How about the data file? If you have a little CSV, but it's linked, like, but that is linked to your local. Like, how do you upload? like a data chunk. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So the, each project comes with a certain amount of uh, memory, like in process memory and hard drive space. So you can upload, uh, it right here is actually in the bottom right. You know, it says mm -hmm. cloud then project. This is a mini little file system that's available to this project and just this project. So if you wanted to upload a CSV, you could do that and then you'd be able to load it within the R script here and, and use uh -huh. it just as you would locally. Cool. You, and you, can, you can also reference data that's stored on GitHub. Certainly, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just, yeah. Just give it a URL. Um, give it a URL. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Okay, I'll give that a try. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, and feel free to interrupt if there, if there are any questions or anything. I should have uh, offered that earlier. Um, so, uh, so our Studio Cloud it, it does have a bit of a focus on sort of a classroom environment for educational purposes, which makes a lot of sense uh, because you can imagine, you know, a teacher uh, working with students who are newer to R. You don't want to ask thirty students to install R with these packages and blah blah blah. You want to give them one link. They all, you know, take that link and spin up their own environment that is exactly as you have it. So you'll see there's there's references here to like my classroom, and they have different ways of setting permissions so that. You know, maybe the students can't see each other's projects, but the teacher can. So it, the product is focused a bit more, uh, a bit on the educational side, and then they have the R Studio Pro server, which is meant to be a more enterprise grade, like on-premise installation of R Studio Pro uh, for collaboration between, say, data scientists. Um, but this, I think, is a totally appropriate solution uh, in certain contexts. If you have a small team, you don't want to buy the Pro or maintain the Pro server. Uh, and you want to be able to share analyses, you could you could certainly do that here. And the the um, uh, the community has taken this and ran with it. I wanted to share. This is something I just kind of stumbled on. I was like, of course, this is a great uh, application of our Studio Cloud. Uh, so this is the GitHub page for um, a popular library that it's uh, focused on building tables within R. Uh, use it, so it's called Grammar of Tables, if you remember my Grammar of Graphics. So they're taking that same concept of grammar of, of something and coming up with a grammar for tables. Anyway, that's a, that's a separate presentation, but I thought that was kind of cool. Um, anyway, they have this link here, Test Drive in our Studio Cloud. You click on it and you have a, all the documentation for that library in, re, in runnable scripts that you can then modify and run. Uh, so it's a great way to kind of get your hands dirty and, and play with the, the code here. You'll notice it, it does take a second to kind of spin up the project, but then you have your own instance of this project that you can save to your own kind of local, uh, you know, pers for personal use. Um, so if I go here, okay, in the bottom right here, it has all the different tutorials for creating a table, modifying the parts, formatting the data. You know, this is all runnable. And uh, just a great way to, to get your hands on, you know, a new library and be able to modify things and see how it reacts. I thought that was really clever. Um, you'll notice in the top right here, it says temporary project. So it's saying that I just clicked a link. I haven't actually like saved this here or done anything. I just clicked a link and I'm kind of working with an ephemeral instance of uh, this entire uh, environment, but I can click save a permanent copy and it will 
save this as kind of my own that I can, you know, reuse and share with other people. So that's one application of uh, becoming a bit more cloud native in terms of sharing analyses and being able to rerun analyses. I think another uh, way for analysts to become more cloud native would be to leverage cloud resources. And I, I mentioned that you know my background is more in the Google stack and Google cloud platform. So I wanted to share a, a demonstration here that uses, um, it uses uh, Cloud Run. I have other examples that use uh, BigQuery and cloud storage. So uh, Cloud Run is Google's containerized, uh, um, I'm trying to think of the official name, it's like containers as a service or uh, container serving as a service. But in any case, if you can push something into a Docker container, you can put it on Cloud Run and, and host it uh, there. And, it, and Google can take care of the building of the container and the deployment of the container. So this is one example here. This is a, a Shiny application, so R has a, add-on module called Shiny, which is uh, built around turning your analyses into interactive HTML. Uh, so R Shiny is a method for taking yeah, that, that R Studio IDE and then deploying instead of to a PowerPoint or a PDF, you can kind of deploy to an, an interactive application. You can then take those Shiny applications and very easily turn them into a, a Docker instance, uh, a Docker container that can be pushed up to Cloud Run. So this is an interactive tool that's pulling data from my blog and doing a reverse path analysis. So you, you choose, you know, one of the pages on my blog and here I get to show you how little traffic I get on my blog. <laughs> uh, you know, and you can see how did, how did people reach uh, the blog endpoint. Some people came from entrance over to the home page and some people came from, you know, portfolio. So uh, you'll notice that the URL here is a uh, reverse path, you know, I just give it a name and then some randomly generated URL that Google supplies. Um, you can use your own custom domain if you want to. I didn't opt for that. Uh, but, uh, you know, so this is one example of being able to create a, a dashboard, interactive dashboard. I mean, that's a, kind of essentially what this is, but you can kind of imagine a more traditional enterprise dashboard with a bunch of components and, and charts, you know, s same idea. Um, you'd be able to access cloud resources because it would be running directly in the cloud rather than, uh, you know, running in, in a Google cloud project. So it would have direct access to say BigQuery or other cloud resources pretty easily. Um, but in general, I think the suggestion here is to make sure that we're looking for opportunities to leverage the cloud and, and the work that we do and, and don't feel as limited um, in uh, local resources. I think memory constraints are things that people have probably run into in the past. You know, you've got a 16 gig uh, file sitting on a server, how the hell am I going to parse this and, and process this and do anything with it? So getting a little bit more comfortable with uh, how to leverage the cloud in your day to day is, is certainly uh, encouraged and uh, something that's available to you through through R. Okay, uh, so that was a lot. Um, you'll notice I ended on nine, which is not intentional. <laughs> I had 10 at the beginning and then only realized a half hour before the presentation that I dropped, <laughs> I dropped one along the way, which was around exploratory data analysis. And um, I, won't, I won't go into that, but uh, in any case, email Mark and he'll give you a full refund for the talk if you're not satisfied with uh, only nine nine problems. Um, so where do we go from here? So I just, you know, give a lot of information. Um, you'll probably notice a few themes along the way, right? One is, you know, asking analysts to invest in a more coding uh, uh, skill set, I think is, you know, I'm, I'm sort of suggesting that here. I think that it just unlocks so many possibilities that hopefully, hopefully were made clear through this presentation. Um, but also borrowing from uh, software engineering, you know, for some of these practices. Uh, so, you know, I put it together. I, I, I wrote a blog post about this as well around, you know, measure ops. So this, this concept, we have DevOps. You may have heard the term data ops. I like the term measure ops. Um, coming together around these problems, you know, even if you don't think R is the solution, hopefully some of these problems resonated with you, right? Um, I think coming together as a community around these problems and, and, and acknowledging that, yeah, like we're not really built to collaborate, just the tools that we're using and the way the organization is structured and, and the way my work product is designed, like it would be hell for my coworker to pick this up, you know, tomorrow. I um, mean, just like acknowledging that I think is important and thinking of some tool agnostic 
uh, solutions for that. So whether it's R, whether it's Python, or whether it's code at all, um, well, I guess I am suggesting you know somewhere code is probably involved, but certainly not uh, a stickler for uh, the specific um, vendor or software. Uh, so you know some ideas that. Uh, come out of this are that you know should be focusing on on reproducibility on uh over static snapshots so being able to click a button and rerun an analysis um allows you to you know if somebody picks it up they can rerun it it, it means that if the stakeholder comes back and says i need to change this by one day you can rerun it working out those automated processes over having to do manual steps so certainly i've learned by doing how many dozens of manual GA audits that it's much better to audit that to automate that um, analysis as code I think is is a takeaway here I would love to hear creative suggestions if you know I, I totally understand if somebody's not comfortable learning code and you know maybe there are other solutions here um, I, I'm certainly leading on, leaning on code quite a bit uh, but I think there are just so many benefits that come from treating your analysis as code the being able to you know version it compare results uh, have a centralized library, you know, share it with others. Uh, there's, there's a lot of benefits of treating it, you know, as, as if your analysis is code. And then uh, focusing on collaboration by design. So, you know, it shouldn't be this afterthought that, that you are now forced to collaborate with somebody. It should be that just the way we work is, is done in such a way that it is easy to collaborate because, you know, you're doing work in the cloud, uh, because you're working with code, that's that's centrally versioned um, you know some of the ideas that I brought up here so collaboration by design okay that's it um, how did I do on time it was okay <laughs> I'll be a little bit over uh, yeah so uh, feel free to reach out um, you have my email we'll share the slides uh, I mentioned a lot of um, references to blog posts and github you're more welcome to poke around there uh, yeah, but I think we can do some Q&A. Um, we definitely have time for Q&A, so we want to open that up. So anyone that's interested in asking a question, please feel free to unmute. And also, we have a short survey that has been placed in the chat box. We would love for your feedback so we can continue to uh, create virtual events and evolve and um, go live in person one of these days. Any questions for Adam? Well, I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you, Adam. Nice presentation. Um, one of the things that kind of interesting, you know, you referenced Leland Wilkinson's grammar graphics, um, and he started writing statistical software because he was frustrated with how long it took his batch jobs to run at the University of Illinois Computer Center. Uh, I was one of his graduate students in the 1980s, and um, and and he eventually you know built a software company out of it and and got really into graphics and in the late 80s his software was called SciGraph. it was a module in his systat system and at that time it was the best graphics statistical graphics on any platform i really appreciate that context because i i only knew the grammar of graphics from hadley wickham um you know, through through the R, R work that he's done and, and in Googling it, I, I only then realized like, oh, he didn't come up with this concept. It was it was Leyland uh, who did. So uh, that that's really cool because so, I only found out about him through putting together this presentation and it's good to hear that that took off. I wonder, I mean, if, is he still active today and is he aware of, uh, you know, the R oh, contributions? Yeah, or? yeah he's, he's now, he's an, a pro, you know, professor emeritus at the University of Illinois at Chicago and mm -hmm. he's the chief scientist at H2O AI. And oh, cool. ironically, like when he built his first version of Systat, he built it on a K-Pro that was a luggable computer. And, and he actually wanted to, he pitched it to uh, Norman Nye, who was one of the founders of SPSS. Mm -hmm. And he comes in with this luggable <laughs> K-Pro and Norman Nye laughed him out of his office. <laughs> and like 10 years later, SPSS wound up buying Systat for, you know, scores of millions of dollars. Yeah, 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 yeah. So oh, Lee funny. got the last laugh. <laughs> Great. Any other 
questions or comments? Uh, I, I, I have a quick comment. I, I'm just, as, as Mark Redfern could attest, I, I, I struggle with R at first, and I'm just getting comfortable with uh, plotting, like how to facet and do some weird things, plotting. But one thing I have le I've learned and I've lived in a, a professionally is using Tableau to do the uh, presentation, but doing the back end thing in R or other languages. Yeah. So that is always an option. Yeah. To, yeah. We, we, at this big corporation, a big, large telecom company I work, I contracted for, we would do some analytics behind the scenes, then run the code, test it, connect to the little colored snowflake in Tableau, and boom, there comes your graphics in Tableau, like mm -hmm. in, in a half an hour, I got the analytics, I get the graphics done. So, you know, I've lived that too, where, you know, the, the, the thing, the, the strong point, let's be honest, the strong point about R is it's rich statistics set, it's analytics set, not graphic. I mean, the, the, the learning curve for the graphics, and yeah. Adam has obviously That's mastered fair. it, but it took me a long time to master what I wanted to look at on a screen in R. Uh, and it took me, you know, like a week in Tableau, you know, just because the it was an easier environment, I think, to work with i don't know yeah i, I think that's a totally fair comment is definitely a learning curve <clears throat> for the graphic side and you can imagine a scenario where the team is comfortable with tableau and presenting in tableau but we still get to check off that automation box because you're doing the transformation in r or some other scripting language right so um you know, that way you can sort of get the best of both worlds. You will lose out on, you know, some of those advanced analyses or advanced visualizations that maybe Tableau doesn't provide. But, you know, I think the key here is sort of automating more tasks and saving time and, and helping with collaboration, uh, not necessarily sticking to just, yet yeah, R for visualization. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like it's, it's very helpful. Yeah, have, having R available at, at sort of at your hip. I mean, it definitely um, makes it less intimidating to approach a project because you kind of know, like, if you can't do it in R, you can't do it. <laughs> you know, like, it's just kind of... But it's so applicable in so many different ways. <laughs> right, right. Well, you can't, you can't beat its cost. Yeah, <laughs> right. Right. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, mean, I looked, decided to yeah. learn R in 2015 because... I didn't want to spend nine thousand dollars on a copy of SAS. Right, right. And um, and I was, you know, within a few weeks, was able to to do analyses that you know save my company tens of millions of dollars. Um, and you know, and the software was free. Yeah, and somebody commented in the chat, they're, they're learning Python, but they're interested in, in getting an intro to R. And it reminds me that, you know, there are certain, there are, there are certain libraries in Python that are unavailable in R. So, you know, it's, it's not going to be the perfect tool set. Um, you know, like Google's investing quite a bit in Python and the, uh, you know, the TensorFlow library and everything. So uh, I would say in, in terms of machine learning and predictive modeling, you know, Python can have a bit of an edge there. Uh, but in terms of the, I, I'm not doing predictive modeling daily. I am doing sort of transformation and visualization daily, and that's where R um, really shines. It's it's just such a workhorse for that kind of stuff. So, like for me, I'm I'm a software architect, and so you know I'm applying data analytics and visualizations to software architecture, hmm. and so. That's, I mean, that's that's what I do. But um, it, it's all very insightful, and I can I can definitely use this in a very practical way. Oh, great! That's good to hear. You, you know, Brian, actually, one of the, the application I built in 2015 analyzed the economic value of a portfolio of e-commerce applications, and it was based on business capability modeling, business architecture techniques. So yeah, there's a lot of use for um, a lot of areas where uh, you know, the software development and or architecture can be made a lot more effective with analytics. Hmm. 
someone just come or Bob just commented that the, the issue might be where Python might be versus R in five years. Yeah, I mean <laughs> that you know that goes to that debate that I just like I'm so hesitant to wade into. Um, I yeah I don't I don't think either are gonna you know die out in five years. They'll they'll both continue to grow and get better. Um, and I don't think one is going to totally leapfrog the other in five years. So I think it still comes down. It's just like so context driven. If your organization or if you have a background in Python, you know, or if there is a specific library that you absolutely is critical to the job at hand, and if that leads to one language to the other, then that's totally fine. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, die on this hill if, you know, R is the best for every situation or anything. I think, um, Kind of have to look at the situation and and pick a direction. Hmm. Any other last questions or comments? We are at the top of the hour. No. Well, and thanks so much again for doing sure. this. this really informative. Yeah, thanks for having me. Cool. Uh, so thanks again. Thanks everyone.